Democratic vote. May I have uh, two minutes? Two minutes. Gentlemen, is recognized for the three, three, three minutes. minutes. Three minutes. Lies languishing in the conference committee because it was passed in an extraordinarily partisan fashion. Where Mr. Lucas's bill reported out in a bipartisan fashion, the American public, Mr. Speaker, say, let's act bipartisanly. We did. With Democratic and Republican votes, the Farm Bill came out of the Agricultural Committee and turned into a partisan bill on this floor by my Republican colleagues. And so it languishes. With six days left, with the Farm Bill expiring on December 31st, no action, no progress. We need to pay our doctors a proper compensation for the services they give. I'm sure the gentleman from the Rules Committee, uh, who is himself a medical doctor, understands this uh, uh, necessity. And we need to fix the sustainable growth, but it languishes somewhere out in the netherworld while we have six days left, unfixed, unscheduled. I've asked the majority leader numerous times, is that going to be brought to the floor? It's not to the floor. Discrimination in the workplace, passed by the Senate in a bipartisan fashion, ENDA. Not going to be brought to this floor. Speaker says he's opposed to it. So the House will not be able to work its will again on a piece of legislation that, in my opinion, would have a majority of the votes on this floor. No doubt in my mind. And I'm the whip. I count votes, Mr. Speaker, as you know. And it would have the majority of votes on this floor. But the Speaker and the Majority Leader will not bring it to this floor. Unemployment insurance for 1.2 million people ends on December 31st, and we have six days left to go of full work. And two partial days when we come in at 6.30. And yet unemployment insurance has not been brought to this floor to be extended for those 1.1 million people with still 7.2 or 7.3 percent unemployment. And unemployment insurance, a critically important issue, is somewhere out there but not on this floor. While we consider legislation this entire week that the majority knows will not pass the United States Senate and will not be signed by the President of the United States, even if it was. But they make a message, perhaps, to their base. Politics. While the budget conference, immigration reform, the farm bill, the, the sustainable growth rate, doc reimbursement for Medicare patients, discrimination in the workplace, and unemployment insurance, and yes, I would add to that tax extenders, None of it on this floor. One additional I yield the gentleman for two minutes. The gentleman is recognized for an additional two minutes. No one ought to ask themselves why the American people holds this institution in such low regard. None of us who have served in this institution for any period of time are proud of what we're doing in this Congress. And we lament. We lament the unwillingness of the leadership of this House to have us do work that the American public knows we must be doing. And so, Mr. Speaker, I rise. I rise today in support of the previous question. This is not just an ordinary previous question. What this previous question says, we will not adjourn, American people. We will not adjourn on December 13th, as is projected by the majority to be the date on which we adjourn. We will not adjourn until such time as we have done the important work that the American people expect of us, the responsible work that the American people expect of us, the work that we ought to expect of ourselves. And so we consider this bill. But I would hope that we would defeat the previous question. And if we defeat the previous question, then we will bring to this floor a resolution which will say, we shall not adjourn 
until we have done a budget conference that precludes fiscal crisis, shutting down government, a refusal to pay America's debts that we pass an immigration reform bill that fixes what everybody knows is a broken system, until we bring a farm bill to the floor which will preclude farmers and consumers and those who need nutritional help being put at risk. One additional minute. Gentleman's time has expired. Minute. The gentleman is recognized for an additional one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have in my hand a letter. This is not a letter from Democrats. This is a letter from 13 Republicans, leaders, chairs of subcommittees of the Appropriation Committees that say to the Budget Conference Committee, bring a solution to the floor before the Thanksgiving break and no later than December 2nd. And yet, ladies and gentlemen of this House, Mr. Speaker, and yes, Mr. Speaker, all of us speak to the American people who ought to be asking us why. Why? Why do we waste time when so much important work remains to be done? Defeat the previous question. Allow us to offer a resolution which will say to the American people, we will continue to work until we get your work done. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back time. the balance of his time. A gentleman from Texas. Reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Texas reserves. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I yield myself uh, such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to associate myself with the remarks of our distinguished whip. Um, uh, it is frustrating uh, to serve in the People's House and to watch as this leadership uh, purposely uh, tries to avoid doing the people's business. Um, it is frustrating uh, when you go home and you talk to farmers and they want to know where the farm bill, is, the farm bill is. It is frustrating when you talk to people about immigration and they look at what happened in the United States Senate where it passed overwhelmingly with bipartisan support and we can't even get anything scheduled here. We can't even get anything scheduled here. It is frustrating when people, you know, are, 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 are still reeling over the fact uh, that the Republicans shut the government down and they want to make sure we don't ever repeat it, and yet um, we have no uh, budget uh, uh, resolution, no budget uh, uh, conference that has been, uh, that has been uh, put together uh, to, to make sure that we are on a roadmap, but we don't have any more of these uh, Ted Cruz-led uh, shutdowns around here. Uh, so it is very frustrating. And, um, and I think the gentleman from Maryland um, you know, said it uh, very clearly that the American people are frustrated. It's not just Democrats. It is uh, Democrats and Republicans that are frustrated. And uh, Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman will stage as it. Does the gentleman yield? The gentleman from Massachusetts yield? I, for, yes. Is, is it in order to... The gentleman will stage inquiry. Is it in order to refer to members of the other body by name? Yes. We're allowed to do that now. The chair will not provide advisory opinions. Yeah. So we don't, we don't want another Ted Cruz-led shutdown here in the, in the House of Representatives. I think the American people are fed up with that. And, the, and, and, and then, you know, as the distinguished minority whip pointed out, uh, I mean, we're not, we're not even in session uh, uh, more than six days from now uh, until the end of the year, uh, which is absolutely uh, unconscionable. And you, and you said to yourself, well, maybe, maybe, maybe the Republicans are planning to do something, uh, you know, in, in the future. Maybe they have an agenda for the future. And then we read in Politico uh, that last Thursday a group of House Republicans filed into Majority Leader Eric Cantor's Capitol office suite and received a blank piece of paper labeled Agenda 2014. Just like this, Mr. Speaker. This is their agenda for 2014. And a Republican aide put it more bluntly, by saying what we have done so far this year clearly hasn't worked. Um, this, is, uh, this is their agenda for next year. It might as well be the agenda for the rest of this year. Um, it's nothing. Nothing that is improving the quality of life uh, for the people that we represent. Uh, and again, it, it, it fuels a cynicism all across the country uh, that, uh, that, that uh, the majority party here doesn't seem to care about what happens to regular people. Uh, and that is very, very disconcerting. 
I guess they could go back and say that, you know, their big accomplishment was that they complained about the Affordable Care Act. Over 40-something times they brought bills to the floor to try to repeal it, never once offering an alternative to improve it, never once giving an alternative idea that would help address the fact that tens of millions of our citizens don't have health insurance and millions do have health insurance but it's really not health insurance because when they get sick they realize they've been paying for a policy that provides them nothing but there's no alternative there's no alternative agenda to try to address those issues it's just they're against it i guess it's easy to say no um, but the bottom line is i think the american people are looking for us to say yes to some things so mr speaker um, if we defeat the previous question i will offer an amendment to the rule uh, to bring up house resolution 424 Ranking Member Slaughter's resolution prohibiting an adjournment of the House until we adopt a budget conference report. What that means is that we should not adjourn until we do our job. That shouldn't be a radical idea. I'd like to think there's bipartisan consensus that we ought to do our job, and that's what this would require. So, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to insert the text of the amendment in the record along with extraneous materials, um, with, along with extraneous material immediately prior to the vote on the previous question. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote no uh, and defeat the previous question. I urge a no vote on the rule uh, and on the underlying bills, which, to be honest with you, are a waste of our time. They are going nowhere in the Senate, and the President has already issued a veto threat on them. And with that, Mr. Speaker, um, with one last um, urging of my Republican colleagues to, uh, to stay here and do your work, uh, with that, I will yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. I thank the Speaker. I'll yield myself uh, the balance of our time. The gentleman is recognized. You know, Mr. Speaker, it was a little over a year ago the American people went to the polls and in their wisdom, they elected divided government. They knew what divided government looked like. They had seen it for the two years prior. The president came to town in 2009 and promised a lot of sweeping changes, and he delivered on those sweeping changes during the first two years of his administration. Had a health care bill passed. Health care bill passed without a single Republican vote. You talk about a partisan vote. The Patient Protection Affordable Care Act was a partisan vote, and unfortunately, as we're seeing now, as we have convulsed the country with these changes that are occurring within the insurance system, we have see the changes that are going to occur to our providers, our doctors, our hospitals, our nurses in the months ahead. This is a serious situation, and it required serious action be taken. I won't apologize for any action that's been taken by the majority in this House to try to rein in the excesses of the administration and a previous Democratic-controlled Congress when they took over one-sixth of the nation's economy in a partisan fashion without a single Republican vote. The sequester was passed in August of 2011. was passed at the request of the President. The gentleman's talked about shutdowns and defaults in the government. Do you remember that the sequester was a compromise proposed by the President and the Office of Management of the Budget at the White House in order to prevent defaulting on our debt? A very difficult vote for many of us in this House. But what has the sequester delivered? The sequester delivered what no one had been able to deliver previous, in the four years previously, and that is a federal budget deficit that's below $1 trillion. Doesn't sound like a big ask that the American people had. We want you to stop spending so much money. The sequester delivered on that promise, and I find it strange now that the gentleman from Massachusetts will impugn the integrity of people who voted in favor of that sequester when the president and the minority leader of the House of Representatives now want to take credit for the fact that the deficit was cut in half over the last four years. The only reason it was cut in half was because they raised it to unsustainable levels and now the sequester has reined that back in. And it's quite likely that the deficit at the end of fiscal year 2014 will in fact be lower if we don't do something to damage the trajectory that we are on. The immigration bill passed by the Senate, 
I don't think it's here at the House. I think it's got an origination problem and it's unconstitutional. If there's a bill at the desk, I'd be happy to look at it, but I don't think that has occurred. And the gentleman knows that. This bill that we're considering today would lower the price of natural gas delivered to consumers in the state of Massachusetts. I have a table prepared by the Committee on Energy and Commerce. The average pot price for natural gas, the national average, is $9.19 per thousand cubic feet. In Massachusetts, it's $13.18. So this is a bill today that could deliver product to the con gentleman's constituents in Massachusetts at a much more reasonable price. This sounds to me like a bill that will help the economy. This sounds to me like a bill that may provide jobs for the American people. I would like to ask unanimous, unanimous consent that the uh, table prepared by the Committee on Energy and Commerce be put into With, the record. Without objection, so ordered. The minority whip talked about the dock fix. Our committee, Committee on Energy and Commerce, did pass in a bipartisan fashion a repeal of the sustainable growth rate formula. I think it's a good bill. I think it was a bill that where we had participation from both sides of the dais, not a single dissenting vote, when we voted on the bill in committee right before the August recess. There is another body here in the Capitol building they are considering their own version of a similar bill in the appropriate finance committee over in the other body. I don't want to prejudge or preclude what they will or won't do. I am anxious for them to do something that would give us a negotiating point where we could consider moving forward with a final repeal of this problem. But in fact, the legislative branch consists of two bodies this body and the other body on the other side. Until the Finance Committee acts, there's little more that the Energy and Commerce can do to, uh, to push that bill forward. Well, Mr. Speaker, today's rule provides for consideration of a critical bill to ensure our energy infrastructure needs are being met. Mr. Pompeo has done a good job. I applaud him and our committee for the thoughtful legislation. I urge my colleagues to support both the rule and the underlying bill. I'm now prepared to yield back the balance of my time and move the previous question on the resolution. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The question is on ordering the previous question on the resolution. All those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker. The gentleman from Massachusetts. On that, I ask for the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 9 of Rule 20, the chair will reduce to five minutes the minimum time for any electronic vote on the question of adoption. This is a 15-minute vote. The House this afternoon has been debating the rule for a bill that would set deadlines for federal certification of permitting for natural gas pipelines. This is the previous question. Democrats trying to bring up a resolution that would prohibit the House from adjourning until a budget conference agreement is reached and reporting on the, uh, the progress of the budget conference committee between the House and Senate. CQ says that the familiar divide over tax revenue is slowing progress toward a budget deal. Among conferees who are working to produce an agreement by December 31st, the deadline, they say the revenue difference has come into sharper relief in recent days as House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan and Senate Budget Chairwoman Patty Murray continue private talks aimed at agreeing on a discretionary spending limit for the current fiscal year and potentially replacing some of a portion of the sequester. That's from uh, CQ on the status of where budget talks are. During this 15-minute vote, we're going to bring you a conversation from this morning's Washington Journal with one of the members of the House Budget Committee.
And we're back with Congressman Vicki Hartzler, Republican of Missouri, sits on the Budget Committee as well as the Armed Services Panel. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Let me begin with the Wall Street Journal and the headline that Senator Mitch McConnell, the leader for the Republicans in that chamber, came over to the House Republicans for your weekly meeting yesterday and said, we need to stand firm on these spending cuts, on sequestration, and let it happen, even if it means cutting, cutting the Pentagon's budget. What, did, what do you think? Well, he didn't specifically address the defense. Um, I'm for keeping the lower number, but I think we need to get our priorities right as a country. And one of the few things we're supposed to be doing here in Washington is to provide for the common defense. So uh, if I had my druthers, I'd certainly like to replace those defense cuts, but then reprioritize the budget and still keep it on a, on a path that'll get us to a balanced budget. So keep, keep the bottom number, mm -hmm. but cut somewhere else, not at the Pentagon at all? Well, I think we need to restore the $20 billion cuts that are scheduled to go into effect if uh, sequestration continues. You know, uh, the defense only makes up about 18% of the budget, but yet has had to uh, incur about 50% of the cuts. And it's very, very damaging uh, to our military. And uh, I have a lot of concerns about what its implications are to our national defense. Explain the, the damages, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. potential damages, or the damages yes. that have been done so far. Right. Well, I'm on the Armed Services Committee and I'm on the Readiness Subcommittee, and so we have had multiple hearings talking about the readiness of our military to be able to meet the threats that we are facing. And because of the cuts, we have seen um, a lot of the training set aside, and uh, the report is that there's only two out of 42 of our Army brigades that is combat ready. Uh, we've had to set aside uh, 31 squadrons have been grounded this year. Uh, we have pilots that are doing their training on simulators uh, rather than uh, in their airplanes, and that is obviously very concerning. The Navy has had to cancel five deployments of various uh, carrier groups, and we only now have one carrier group in the Mediterranean. And the Marines are having to shift around their readiness dollars just to provide for the training. We're hearing stories, of course, of, of uh, airplanes sitting on the tarmacs, uh, of not even having some bullets for uh, our soldiers to train with. So this is very concerning, and I feel like we cannot hollow out our forces. Um, we've got to be able to meet whatever challenge uh, our nation faces. Another $20 billion would do what? Well, it would it make that even further, uh, I mean, it would decrease the amount of training even further that is allowed. Um, and ultimately, if this trajectory continues after 10 years, uh, we're going to see an additional 100,000 soldiers that are let go out of the Army. And we would have the uh, smallest Air Force uh, ever in our country. Uh, we would have the smallest Navy since World War I. We would have the smallest um, um, Army uh, since before World War II, and uh, that is just not acceptable in my book. Do you have uh, a military base in your district? I have two bases. We have Whiteman Air Force Base, which is home of the B-2 uh, stealth bomber, and we also have Fort Leonard Wood, which is one of the basic training uh, sites for our Army, but it also has a chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear school, military, police school, and engineering school uh, for our country. And what impact have they seen from sequestration? Well, certainly at, uh, at Whiteman, there's less uh, training hours now. The, the B-2 bomber has been uh, protected since that is the only site for that, so their training hours are still current. Uh, but some of the other missions are, um, you know, seeing less training hours, and, and certainly at, at Fort Leonard Wood, it's uh, been concerning, certainly with the, the furloughs of the civilian employees that we have incurred this summer, and both at Whiteman as well, is... Uh, is, is damaging for the morale of the troops and for the community as a whole. If you don't cut from the Pentagon, where, where does that money mm -hmm. come from then? Where do you cut? Well, twofold. When you're trying to balance the budget, I used to teach home economics, and I would get with my students and say how to make a family budget. And if it's not balancing, there's two things you can do. You can decrease spending or increase revenue. And first and foremost, if we could just put some revenue-enhancing opportunities for growth, and I'm not talking tax increases, I'm talking about getting jobs back. Uh, that would bring more revenue back into our, our country. For instance, something simple is to approve the Keystone Pipeline, uh, which would provide more jobs. But if we could provide more certainty for job creators, 
then I know that uh, businesses would grow, they would hire, and part of that is to have some certainty about our health care system, uh, which right now is in m major turmoil. Employers do not know what to expect from uh, the president's health care plan and their implications, so they're not hiring and they're laying off workers and so if we could get that right that would make a huge difference for our economy uh, but the other thing is to spend wisely. We have 60% of the budget, which is mandatory spending categories, and that is really what's driving up our deficit. So it's time to uh, uh, be smart and to reform and strengthen these important programs. The co-chairs of that conference committee have said a grand bargain is just elusive. They cannot do it. it they don't have mm -hmm. enough time. Uh, and so, therefore, entitlement reforms not on the table. So to avoid this next round of mm -hmm. sequestration cuts, what do you cut? I mean, specifically, what programs would you cut? Well, I'm also a member of the Agriculture Committee, and uh, we have a farm bill that is now in conference, and we are uh, looking at making reforms there. The House version has $40 billion in uh, reforms and uh, that will save taxpayer dollars, and to replace the defensive, the, the cuts to defense, to the Defense Department, right. there we go. Uh, that would be, we need 20 billion next year. So there are places that, that we can look and I'm hopeful that uh, we can make it happen. All right, well let's get to phone calls. Dave okay. is up first in Albuquerque, New Mexico, independent caller. Hi Dave. Hi, Vicki, I was wondering as a member of the uh, Budget Committee, would you be in favor of means testing Social Security and Medicare down to $100,000 a year and, and hope that that saves uh, Medicare and Social Security for another 20 or 30 years? Well, I think it's time to start the discussion. Um, you know, Social Security is vital to senior citizens all across this country, and it's scheduled to go uh, bankrupt in a, about 20 years. The disability portion is scheduled to go uh, run out of money in only three years. And so we can't keep kicking the can down the road, and it's time to, to have a discussion on how to preserve and protect this important program. And uh, so I hope that that discussion can be begin because uh, it is very, very important and we have to protect it and not just kick the can down the road. What do you make of the headline in Politico that the chairman of the Agriculture Committee, Frank Lucas, said it's deadline week this week, that they need to come to some sort of deal with the Senate on um, a conference bill for the farm legislation? It certainly would be great if we could get it this week. I think that's a that's a certainly good goal, um, and it's very important. We have been uh, talking about this for three years now. We're at the conference committee stage, so that's very encouraging. I understand that they have uh, a lot of agreement on most of the portions. There's just three main sections that they're still uh, discussing, and there are quite a few differences in that area. But you know, let's get it done this week. That Do would be great. Do you think if if that happens, that it becomes some sort of budget deal? Because as you were saying, mm -hmm. the budgeteers, the conference committee, mm -hmm. is looking at that at farm subsidies as a way to lower spending. So does it get attached to some sort mm -hmm. of budget deal? Well, I was, I've been visiting with some of the conference committees on budget, and at this point they say that that is not part of the conversation, but just as a, a member of both the budget and the ag committees, it seems like that might be a win-win for both sides. All right. Uh, let's go to Bob in Fond du Lake, Wisconsin. Independent caller. Uh, good morning, ladies. How are you doing today? Morning. Good. Happy Thanksgiving first. Uh, first, I have a question. I talked to a lot of people in my hometown and the question always comes up, who in the heck is really in charge up there? You don't have to answer that. <laughs> my, my comment, though, is we are sending billions and billions and billions of dollars to foreign countries every day. Isn't it about time they stop that at, at least for a year? Put a hole on it for a year mm -hmm. and get America back straight again. Sure, that comes up a lot at, at home as well, and uh, as I've looked into that, I discovered that foreign aid only makes up about 1% of our entire budget, so if you were to cut that out, that would not uh, balance the budget, but it is worth a discussion, you know. I think it's time to quit spending money and sending it to nations that don't, uh, don't like us and where we don't have a, a vital U.S. interest, and that's why last year the House did cut some funding for some of the countries. Uh, 
and we put some stipulations on some others saying you need to follow these guidelines in order to get our aid. Uh, but foreign aid is a, a tool, a diplomatic tool uh, that is important. Many times we do have a vital U.S. interest in other countries and so it's important that we work with those countries to make sure that they are advancing uh, uh, agendas that will be helpful to us uh, and spend those dollars wisely. Uh, so I think we should examine each country and see if we have that interest there and uh, either cut or continue to support as is warranted. D.D. Fredericks on Twitter, is defense spending considered an entitlement or are we acting too much like an empire providing defense for the world? And James and Ard says, way too many brigades and squadrons cut the defense budget in half and America may survive this debt problem, maybe. You know, uh, it is a discretionary spending category uh, along with all of the other programs here in Washington, D.C. And put those together, that makes up only about 40 percent of the budget. And I was shocked when I got here two years ago uh, to see really the, uh, how sobering it is, our, our debt situation and the fact that we could cut all of defense and we could cut every program here in Washington, D.C. And then we still would not have a balanced budget. So we cannot actually balance the budget on the defense. We're going to have to address the other 60% of the, the budget. And uh, get back to our Constitution, there's only a few things we should be doing, but the number one thing is to provide for the common defense. So I think we have to be smart and make sure and prioritize that. Let's go back to that meeting that the Wall Street Journal reported about this morning, yesterday with the Senate Minority Leader mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell talking to you and other House Republicans at your mm -hmm. annual weekly gathering. What did he say exactly to all of you, and what was the reaction from your fellow House Republicans, specifically those on the Armed Services Committee? Well, he was just uh, kind of outlining what he was seeing uh, on the Senate side and that in these negotiations that if uh, uh, that we've got to continue to try to hold hold steady and uh, our plan, which is reducing the spending and getting to a balanced budget. I mean, that's our ultimate goal. Uh, our House budget gets there in 10 years where the Senate budget never balances and it raises taxes by a trillion dollars. Ours does it without raising taxes. And uh, even though we do not like the sequestration, I voted against the Budget Control Act that uh, set that in motion. It has enabled us as a country to reduce discretionary spending for two years in a row, which has not been done since the 1950s, right after the Korean War. And it's not the best way to do it. We would prefer to look at each program and determine priorities, which ones need to be spent more on and which ones we need to spend less. Uh, but it has at least accomplished the goal of starting to get us on a path to get out of, of debt. Um, but we, uh, we need to keep continuing to fight for that because it's good for, for our country uh, to get out of debt. The Wall Street Journal reports this morning, uh, Janet Hook, Damian Paletta's piece, that if a deal is not reached between the budget committee negotiators, the House and Senate Conference Committee, uh, then overall discretionary spending would drop from $986 billion to $967 billion for fiscal year 2014, with most of those cuts coming from the Pentagon. Abby in Culpeper, Virginia, Democratic caller. You're on the air. Go ahead. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Um, I just wanted to ask the representative, uh, Nikki, can I just ask you directly if I can stay on the line just so I can hear. Um, I believe very, very strongly that within our lifetime, we will end war. And so, you know, I heard her say, heard her statistics that it would mean, you know, the troops are lower than World War One for the Air Force and, uh, you know, the, the other services. And I think that's great. I think as soon as the the Democrats come together as strongly as the Republicans are, even though sometimes they seem idiotic, they stick together. If the American people, the people of America, get together, believe me, we will end war. We don't need it. We don't need the weaponry. We're already stronger than all the other major, okay, uh, military institutions of the world. We're already stronger. We don't need to spend this. We need to help the American people. We need the American people to come together. Listen to me. Mm -hmm. Everybody, be real. All right, Congresswoman. Sure. Well, I certainly wish that was so. I, I think he's very hopeful, but I don't see that that is um, uh, really going to happen. I think it was up to Americans. That's 
you know, we would certainly live at peace with everyone in the world, but there are other people in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, I mean, who uh, do not like us and do not appreciate freedom. And there are some very real threats out there. Uh, if you look at North Korea, um, that's a threat. You look at Iran, that's a threat. You look at the uh, terrorist groups all around the country who have vowed and said that they want to destroy the United States. And if they have that capability, they could. So it is wise for us to uh, be prepared and to be willing to not only defend ourselves, uh, but also our allies. And uh, we certainly don't invite war, but we need to be prepared for it. And so that's why I think it's important that we keep the capabilities that we have and uh, are able to meet any challenge that may come our way. Smiley uh, on Twitter says, Representative Hartzler, you represent one of the poorest districts in Missouri. So don't you want Medicaid expansion, and why do you want to cut food stamps? Oh, okay, well that's, that's a great question because that's not exactly um, um, true. As far as let's take the, the food stamps uh, situation, uh, we are not in the Farm Bill proposing to cut any uh, food from anybody who qualifies. And it's very important to me that everyone in my district and in this country that uh, needs a food assistance that they get that because that is very important to families. Uh, what we do want to do is get rid of some waste and some fraud and some abuse in the system and save tax dollars for, while doing it. So part of the cuts that are uh, savings that would come from that would be from just reducing some of those uh, programs such as right now we're going down into Mexico and we have programs to uh, promote how to uh, sign up for food stamps and you know we don't need to be spending money that way people with lotteries lottery winners are getting food stamps uh, but we also go back to the 1996 welfare reform law that was very successful and signed by Democratic President uh, Bill Clinton that said if you're an, an able-bodied adult without dependents uh, so a very small category of people, but in that category, you should be willing, to, in, in order to get your uh, SNAP benefits, be able to work for 20 hours a week or volunteer for 20 hours a week or um, have some sort of work training for 20 hours a week. And we think that's very reasonable and uh, that would provide a lot of savings, but yet everybody who qualifies should qualify. Um, and as far as Medicaid expansion, that is a state issue, so that's up to the Missouri legislature uh, to determine that. And so they're the ones that is discussing that right now. Um, as far as the uh, food stamp program being cut, uh, the Senate wants to cut $4.5 billion. Uh, the House has a much larger um, cut yeah. in its legislation. Is that, is that's all waste, fraud, and abuse? No. Uh, the Senate has not agreed to going back to the 96 welfare reform law and uh, allowing for the work requirements on able-bodied adults without children, dependents. So that's one of the differences there. And the other one is that in the House we stopped something called categorical eligibility, which is being abused in some states, which basically says that if you qualify for one public assistance program, such as uh, energy assistance for your home, then automatically they're giving them uh, food stamps. And even though the qualifications are different, and we're just saying everybody should fill out the paperwork for SNAP, uh, and if you need it, you qualify, then absolutely you will get it. But if your income levels don't qualify, then no longer should you be able to get that benefit. House Republicans want to cut the food stamp program by $39 billion over 10 years. Right, it is over 10 years. Keep that in mind. I want to also go back to your comments earlier about Iran and get your take on mm -hmm. a meeting at the White House yesterday. This is the front page of the Washington uh, Post. Vote on Iran sanctions put off as the talks in Geneva resume. A bipartisan group of senators emerged from a two-hour White House meeting saying there would likely be no vote this week on proposed new sanctions targeting Iran's oil industry. I disagree with that strongly. I think that President Rouhani has come to the table because of the sanctions. They're starting to feel the impact of that. And if anything, now's the time we need to be pushing even harder and passing more sanctions because the deal that uh, President Kerry, uh, I mean, uh, Secretary of State Kerry was willing to uh, approve last week, and thankfully France was the one that said no deal, would have uh, allowed them to continue to spin their centrifuges and to enrich their uranium. Uh, it would have wouldn't have stopped it. It called it a freeze, but that wasn't a total uh, stopping of it. It was allowing to continue that. 
and it is they are very very close to nuclear weapon capability and they have pledged in the past that if they have the nuclear weapon that they plan to use it to annihilate israel and the united states uh... so i think you know i disagree with that i think we need to be uh, passing more sanctions if anything to force them to stop and cease their program and uh, make sure that we're safe. And your thoughts on this emerging deal between Afghanistan and the United States. This is the headline in the Washington Times. Kerry Karzai worked to write draft security agreement for U.S. troops, keeping U.S. troops there. In exchange, the United States would apologize for harm that's been done to Afghans. Wow. Well, that is, uh, I had not had a chance to read that yet. Uh, obviously, we need a new a security agreement with Afghanistan and uh, for what, where we go beyond 2014 when our troops will be out. Um, and I think it is wise to have a presence there still uh, to make sure, assist the Afghan security forces and help them uh, maintain the gains that have been made. But to apologize, I think, uh, doesn't make any sense at all because we have helped those people uh, so much. I've had a chance to go there on a congressional delegation and see firsthand the improvements that we have brought to the lives of the people there. And uh, I, I think, uh, if anything, they should be thanking us uh, for the sacrifices and the service and the, the dollars and resources that we have put into their country. Well, this is how the New York Times describes it. They say uh, months of fraught negotiations and public posturing over how a long-term American military force could remain in Afghanistan have suddenly come down to a demand for a single personal gesture, a display of contrition by President Obama for military mistakes that have hurt Afghans. As described by Mr. Karzai's spokesman, the letter would be tantamount to an apology though that word was not used. Wow. I, I'm tired of us going around the world and apologizing for things that we have done, which has uh, actually helped other countries, and we've used tax dollars. So um, I hope uh, you know, that that won't be accepted and that we can work out some deal without that. Lauren Piller wants to go back to this discussion about cuts to the Pentagon, saying uh, cut half the civilian jobs in the Pentagon and cut half the contractors. They feed off each other using the American taxpayers' money. Hmm. Well, it's important to look at all aspects of the Pentagon's budget to see where cuts can be made. But I think overall, it, uh, as we could tell, with training being uh, sidelined, and uh, it's very damaging right now to our national defense. So we need to replace those defense cuts. Danny's been waiting in Nevada, Missouri, Republican caller. Hi, Danny. Good morning. Hi. Yeah, so I'd like for you to address the, what I have heard reported just uh, very little, and uh, and we've done it in almost every conflict, which is that the, as the Afghan war is drawing down, we're destroying billions of dollars worth of equipment that I feel like could be recycled or allies or whatever. I understand there's lots of things that can't be, but there's lots of equipment and things. I know in the past, wars like they push things into the ocean just to get rid of it. Maybe you could enlighten me a little bit. Sure, and uh, it's good to hear from you, uh, Danny. Nevada, Missouri is in my district. Oh, actually. sorry, I mispronounced it. Well, it's Nevada as a state, it's Nevada <laughs> as a city. But uh, thanks for your question, Danny. I have actually participated in several hearings at Armed Services on that very question, on the drawdown and what uh, how they're going to do it, how they are doing it. Obviously, they have brought a lot of equipment back out as well as troops. And there have been, uh, they ha each piece of equipment goes through an assessment process to determine if, if it makes sense uh, financially for the taxpayer to bring it home because they have to uh, transport it out, drive it out, or whatever, through many times Pakistan, uh, and then either put it on a ship or transport it by plane back here. And so they try to recover all the equipment that makes sense to bring back, where they can take it to the depots, do the maintenance on it, and bring it back uh, readiness to, to use uh, like brand new. Some equipment has been destroyed there just in the course of the conflict. Um, other uh, equipment, which is too expensive, they deem to bring home, uh, that's worn out, but it still has some use in it. Sometimes they are giving it to the allies or working out some agreement with Afghanistan, transitioning. So 
I felt uh, better about it after participating in that hearing, at having the opportunity to ask those questions and hearing the commanders explain how that's being done. Uh, I think they're doing it in a prudent manner. They're not going to be destroying anything just for the sake of destroying it. So it'll either be brought home or, and, or refabricated or uh, uh, given to the Allies or worked out some system. So uh, there won't be any waste. So thank you for your question. Rick in uh, Moores Hill, Indiana, independent caller. Yes, ma'am. I have a question for the representative. Okay, go ahead. Uh, isn't it true that in Afghanistan and also Iraq, we had a lot of duplicate spending? Uh, we have soldiers that are trained to support our troops, and we also have private companies like Halliburton and KBR that are doing the same jobs that our individuals are trained to do. Now, if we're going to spend money here, how are we going to train our troops? and duplicate the same spending. Wouldn't this be a, a cut uh, by deep privatizing our, our uh, military? Mm. Uh, that's question one. Another question, you uh, mentioned the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, during, the, during the construction of Key, Keystone Pipeline, I heard this said in, in the Senate, I watched it on C-SPAN, that uh, it would create 2,500 jobs. But after the construction, only 40 jobs would exist after it is constructed. How is this going to help our economy, and does it not benefit only one group, corporate spending, corporate, corporate America? Okay, great, great questions. Um, I, I know and I've heard stories about uh, Iraq. Uh, I've only been here two and a half years to so deal more with Afghanistan. I'm, I'm not aware at this point of the private contractors duplicating the, the, the missions that are going on right now with our, our troops in Afghanistan. Uh, primarily, we have the Army providing ground troop support to the Afghan security forces that now are in charge of all the operations there. Uh, our Air Force is providing that close air support with their airplanes, and uh, that's the, the main... The nays are 195. The previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have Mr. Speaker, Massachusetts. on that I ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five-minute vote. And the House moves on to the vote on the rule for a bill that would set deadlines for federal certification of permitting for natural gas pipelines. This is a five-minute vote. A number of two-minute votes are ahead on legislation that um, the House started yesterday that would boost oil and gas production on federal lands. Expect final passage on that this afternoon. They're also taking up another energy bill, a bill that would prohibit the Interior Department from enforcing federal rules that are related to fracking in states that have their own, already have their own fracking regulations. So the rule vote here, amendment votes ahead on the House floor.
On this vote, the yeas are 225 and the nays are 194. The resolution is adopted without objection. A motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Purpose the gentleman. Pursuant to House Resolution 419 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 1965. Will the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Womack, kindly take the chair. Do we need to get their attention? The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 1965 which the clerk will report by title. A bill to streamline and ensure onshore energy permitting, provide for onshore leasing certainty, and give certainty to oil shale development for American energy security, economic development, and job creation and for other purposes. When the committee of the whole rose on Tuesday, November 19th, 2013, a request for a recorded vote on amendment number eight printed in part A of House Report 113-271, by the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. DeFazio, had been postponed. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, proceedings will now resume on those amendments printed in Part A of House Report 113-271, on which further proceedings were postponed in the following order. Amendment number 2 by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. Amendment number 3 by Mr. Lowenthal of California. Amendment number 4 by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. Amendment number 7 by Mr. Polis of Colorado. Amendment number 8 by Mr. DeFazio of Oregon. The chair will reduce to two minutes the time for any electronic vote in this series. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number two, printed in part A of House Report 113-271, by the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number two, printed in part A of House Report number 113-271, offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise. Sufficient number having risen. A recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a two-minute vote. The House this week is working on several bills dealing with oil and gas energy. They started work on this one yesterday. This would, uh, this would boost oil and gas production on federal lands. Several amendment votes here. This one's by Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas, an amendment that would add a right to petition statement regarding the bill's protest fee provisions. All of these amendment votes, and there are five of them, will be two minute votes, and then we expect a, a Democratic motion to recommit and final passage on that. Later on, they will, uh, the House will take up another energy bill, this one dealing with uh, prohibiting the Interior Department from enforcing federal rules on uh, hydraulic fracturing in states that all already have their own uh, fracking laws. Over in the Senate, meanwhile, debate continues on the Defense Programs and Policies Bill, the Authorization Bill for Fiscal Year 2014. Off the floor today, the Homeland Security Committee in the Senate proved the, the uh, nomination of Jay Johnson to be Homeland Security Secretary.
The yeas are 199, the nays are 222. The amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number three, printed in part A of House Report 113-271, by the gentleman from California, Mr. Lowenthal, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number three, printed in part A of House Report number 113-271, offered by Mr. Lowenthal of California. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of a recorded vote will rise. Special number having risen. A recorded vote.